let's talk directorially again. How, it seems like I I learned working on the film with you that you were constantly trying to give the audience as little as possible so that they could figure it out. And a lot of what you cut out of your writing was stuff that I think really clarified what was going on. Yes. And, I mean, t can you talk about that for a moment? Uh, well, I mean, as a, as a writer, my, my big rule is find what you're trying to say and don't say it. Mm -hmm. And in avoiding what I was trying to say with the film, I was saying, uh, I was complaining a lot about filmmaking. I was making a lot of veiled criticisms of right. film. It's an allegory for the Hollywood. This, this film is an allegory for my experience in independent film right. with Ken. And Parker and Longbow end up at the end of the first scene and the end of the film bloody and beaten <laughs> and completely savaged for being who they are. Right. And the money drives away with somebody else <laughs> and that that the the scene you know the, the scene in the birthing room towards the end of the film uh is 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 an analogy of trying to make a film the idea of delivering a child having your child delivered by somebody who is as equal a parent but is not someone you trust right uh and in the original script you'll remember painter was a much less trustworthy character and he, he wasn't was, at all together you know he was he was so was freaked out mess. and tried to leave the room and when parker and longbow leave they have to give robin a gun so she's holding oh, painter that's right. at gunpoint <laughs> yeah and remember it was at night so the power went out so right. she's holding a flashlight and pointing a gun, gun at the doctor <laughs> while he's cutting her open to take out their child and that's filmmaking that's, <laughs> that to me is the distributor saying don't look at the way we're advertising <laughs> this editing. film you'll vomit <laughs> how much of as a director did you seize on like happy accidents jimmy Kahn showed up i think with some back pain. No. I heard he did. I no, heard he that's his back out. Now, everybody says, what's wrong with Khan? It's like he's got arthritis. Well, I think it works great for the no, character. Look at his neck. G the, Jimmy has a friend, as only Jimmy Khan would. He has a friend with a bullet hole in his neck. Yeah. That's been through this horrendous life. And you see how Jimmy has highlighted the scars on his yeah. the bridge of his nose and his eyebrow. Jimmy said, the character is a survivor. I mm -hmm. want to show what he survived. I want to show that he has not lived through this unscathed mm -hmm. he's not superman and i want to show this guy's vulnerability without giving away what is truly vulnerable about him and so he brought in pictures of this bullet hole scar and he he worked with the makeup department i didn't see it until it was ready to go right and uh and no all of that was jimmy's d desire to create in sarno a character who lived up to the line, a broken down old man. Yeah, and he does. Like he he does. He's and great. it was very brave of him. He was yeah. not afraid. He was not afraid to play the character. But that Jimmy wasn't afraid to show up and play up the lines about an old yeah. man and to let people abuse him and to not have to react to that. And my direction to him was always: when people insult you, you just smile and let it pass because right. you're going to win. Yeah, take the claws off. You know that they're all stupid and young and they're going to be dead. To any first-time director, whenever you're directing a scene with extras in the background, after the first rehearsal, or during the first rehearsal, don't even watch the actors. Watch the extras. Mm. Scott actually uh, pushed me in the, in the, to, uh, to add coverage to this scene. Originally, I was only covering the scene from this angle. Mm. In my rather foolish obsession uh, with uh, shooting things in Masters in Two Shots. <laughs> and it was Scott who insisted that I cover the scene from another angle. Yeah, well, no one ever really caught the Woody Allen influence. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's, it, yeah. the, the Manhattan of yeah. it all. Uh, it, it, yeah, I, okay. I'll, I'll take credit for stealing from that. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. No, I know you didn't, Joe. Dad, I have the baby. Um, and I'm, I'm actually glad I did. There's, there's a... It, it was interesting having storyboarded so much of the movie, uh, having prepared myself so completely and thinking that I knew how things were going to play out and so determined to destylize the film and keep myself out as a director uh, I had no idea. that I actually painted myself into some pretty ugly corners in the second act of the film. It's really yeah. gotten... So there's a lot of essential information that you want to convey, but there's no way to cut to it any quicker. And, right. And you, painted, I get, you painted me in a corner. <laughs> yeah, I certainly did. Um, and I guess if you're going to... if, if Neil Pollack, uh, who's a director friend of mine. And the in, an interview guy in the and, beginning. Right, the, the interview guy at the beginning of the film. 
Neil uh, spoke to me the day before I started shooting. Um, it's your bed to lie in. And he said, listen, my only advice to you, and this was the only advice I took from any director on the movie, because mm -hmm. I, I wanted, basically, I wanted the mistakes to be my own. Right. My um, and I knew there would be many. And uh, Neil said, look, my only advice to you is never stop shooting. Yeah. Never, ever, ever stop shooting. And unfortunately, in many scenes, I did. And this is one scene where Scott Wilson came to me and just said, you can't, you don't have it. And I'm, I'm, I'm certain that you're going to be glad you did. Yeah. And sure I'm enough. Sorry. I think he was right. He, well, he was very right. Uh, quite frankly, I think this is a better angle. This is really nice. And this was a scene that in the original flow of the movie was all one scene. And then the Tay and Francesca scene was all one scene. Mm -hmm. And you, we intercut between them to help to keep to things move moving. Them along. And by doing that, you were able to then cut out chunks. Yes. To get you just that much closer to right. the part that you needed. And we tried very hard to do that even further with other scenes to sort of bring things along and move them quicker. And, right. And I apologize to the actors because a lot of their good work, uh, James Caan and Ryan Phillippe especially, who had a great deal more going on in this film, uh, there was just, there was no way to keep it all in, largely because of the way I shot it. Yeah. And, uh... I offer my humblest apologies to you guys. Yeah. I was allotted 6,500 feet a day of film. <laughs> I shot 27,000 feet of film in one day in this room. Wow. Uh, and that, by the way, is bad directing. Not, <laughs> it's not anybody else. It's bad writing and it's bad directing. The actors were struggling so hard with the scene and there were so many things going on subtextually and I had worked so hard to explain to them all the mechanics of what the scene really meant that they, they nobody knew what the hell right. we were doing anymore. Well, this is and this is a scene that's been sort of in your stuck in your craw for what, nine years now? Oh, this is written in another script, you know, a it's, long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. As was the torture, torture scene. scene. Yeah. Um, but to their to their credit, these guys all did a phenomenal job and 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 got us through the scene, and it was it was something else. Because well, after like, yeah, after yeah. everything else you'd been doing, here was the first moment, and we shot the scene. This is one of the few scenes we shot out of sequence at the rest of the film. Was it early in the? It was, it was earlier. Yeah. Uh, you know, here I was. I didn't have my toys. I wasn't directing gunfights and car chases. Right. Suddenly, I had to sit down and have characters interrelate. And I was completely in over my head. You had eight pages of dialogue, <laughs> and and all of which is completely ambiguous and right, uh, com allegorical, allegorical and and indirect and subtextual. We, we can throw pretentious in adjudicate. there. Adjudicate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and God, how we ever got through it. And and originally in the scene, she says, uh, she says, uh, the baby's mine. That starts the whole ball rolling. Right, right. That starts the whole ball rolling. She cries and she gets into those. And Juliet, the, the scene just, the, the character's motivations for what she was saying and why she was crying and how long she had to sustain this emotional outpouring that completely oversold and, and, and undercut her emotional right. situation later in the movie. It, 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 she, she'd have to throw everything out here and there'd be nothing left for later in the film. Right. And so Stephen Semmel uh, and Kenny Culkin, the yeah. two of them while you were gone. Well, I went on my honeymoon and they really attacked the scene and did a phenomenal job. They actually did a phenomenal job attacking this entire movie <laughs> when I was gone. <laughs> Who weeks. hasn't done a phenomenal job attacking this movie? Uh, um, I was, well, what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, what, you, what were you going to say, Joe? On this, our last project together. Oh, comparing this to the rough draft. I mean, at one point in the script, her motivation was to try to sucker these guys in to letting her go. Right. And that they actually they actually leave instead of going up to the sniper position when they leave. Correct. They, they, they leave, leave and then they have second thoughts and come back. And they realize, wait, she's just jerking our chain. Oh, so ridiculous. And, well, it's a neat idea. And I realized the way I scored the scene, you never would have. I mean, I, I never I don't think the audience ever suspects that she's not being honest here because the music sure. plays it so straight. Well, no, we never we played it straight when we finally went to shoot it because right. I didn't I, I got rid of the, all that notion. But your whole thing, what you're talking about with the score and the emotion of the movie. Uh, the 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 I, I had heard the film had been criticized. Someone said that that we had discovered a new genre, which was soap noir. <laughs> and 
that was, it was completely intentional. The idea was to, 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 this is a soap opera. I mean, there's, there's like a, there's a lot of melodrama going on within this very dry sort of arid thing. Right. Uh, you know, the, the idea of the relationships and the reveals and the things like that. It's melodrama. And, well, and, and it was when we started making the movie that we started to realize there were a lot of scenes that we were handling in a much more gritty, realistic manner. Mm -hmm. And as I said to Benicio, you know, these, 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 are, these are all scenes we're going to love watching, but they're, they're really hard to sit through for anybody else. And, and that, that melodrama has its place. Yeah. And I think that as it scenes like this, I mean, if you tried to play this straighter and drier i think i mean god almighty <laughs> we can just cut out everything i'm saying right now no no babbling through this no um and then here's again benicio with his wonderful delivery that's creepy so yeah, always gets a big laugh yeah but it's so it's it's so true to his character yeah it always sounds like he's saying, get me Macquarie, when he walks around the corner. Yeah. Where is that bastard? <laughs> what happened to my performance? <laughs> I was in the first act of the script. Put the cantina scene back in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sick of movies where, uh, you know, the yeah. the, the sort of what, what I call Hollywood one-uppance. Right. That, that every movie is filled with these sort of falsely satisfying this moments of, ha, 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 I showed you. Yeah. And the audience is supposed to laugh along with that. It's so smarmy. And what I loved is that these guys were insulting each other and everybody was letting it roll off their backs because the bottom line is, we're just talking. When I get you outside, we'll see, when, when the bullets start flying, we'll see who's an old man. We'll see who falls. Yeah. And I love the idea that these characters, neither is intimidated by the other, neither is impressed, but there is a certain element of, of respect to the fact that each one of them could... You don't have to be particularly quick or particularly strong to pull a trigger. No. Your job has been to protect. Like you know, <laughs> I've pulled triggers. He said, "I've really got a problem now. This is where I have a problem with Parker and Longbow. I've been with been with them up to now. They shoot this cop in the back, yeah. and then in this scene they, they torture, torture this, guy. this poor guy." This is it, another scene from your other script. Too. This was the scene from from another script and was much longer. And they were pouring club soda up his nose and burning That's his That's right, yeah. And, well, he was hanging upside down in the original yeah. draft. Well, I had club soda when I shot this scene. I just got rid of it. Um, but Dick said, I've been with them up to now, and now they're real. Now what they're doing is, is bothering me. And I said, that's exactly why we're doing it, and that's exactly why we're, we're leaving it in. Mm -hmm. The point was that the, ro the roles of Parker and Longbow have now reversed. And they've ended up in a situation where you may be able to sympathize with them. There's your because, assistant. <laughs> yeah, that's Nathan. Nathan's hands. Nathan Alexander. Um, but suddenly you may be able to sympathize with them because it appears as though they're trying to rescue Juliet. They're not. They're still after the same thing. The money. While their actions may, may seem suddenly forgivable, their intentions aren't. Right. And, and I was more concerned with intention than I was with action. In intention is everything. Intention is everything. The only thing in your control is your intention. Yep. Again, it's not what, what you say anymore. Well, it's how it's all in how you say. <laughs> I love that we just plunk ourselves down in this brothel. Was there any? Were you getting pressure to establish where we were? Uh, yes, and we tried it a couple of times, and I took it out. It, it, in the script, I wanted to drop people in and disorient them and yeah. say, wait, where are we? Holy shit, who is this woman? Right. Why am I looking at a man's ass? <laughs> and then introduce you to the character of the question mark. Uh, we had also shot cutaways to see what Juliet was looking at. And I thought, no, we'll save it for later. Keep them disoriented. Right. Keep them trying to figure out what they're doing and create the, the same sense of disorientation yeah. that she must be feeling. The